So things are a little bit different here this morning. Uh, it's Thanksgiving for one. Thank you also for the beautiful decorations. I hope you all noticed them. Yeah, some people that put a lot of work into that, uh, especially at a time of year like this. And um, so we're doing a little, things a little bit differently. I'll have about a 15-minute sermon time now, and then we'll go to a baptism and conclude the service uh, with a couple of songs uh, as well. Before I start, uh, two announcements that are also in the bulletin I'd just like to briefly draw your attention to. If you're interested in the pastor's welcome class, take a read in the bulletin about that. It starts next week in my office at 9.30 in the morning. Even more important than that, next week is our annual Thanksgiving celebration. And for those of you who are new to our church, uh, one week after the Thanksgiving weekend, we do a special celebration service with a missions focus. So we're pleased to have uh, Youth for Christ backstage with us next uh, week. Uh, Ruben Singh, who's the director, will bring some of the um, uh, leaders uh, in that ministry to our church. They'll be sharing for about 25, 30 minutes, uh, sharing God's word as well. And then we will have the opportunity to do our annual Thanksgiving giving push. And I want to address especially the younger generation uh, on this. Uh, we have a phenomenally generous congregation. And when it comes to things like Thanksgiving and this uh, uh, giving push, uh, lots of people step up to the plate. I hope that you and the younger generation are also learning to give regularly to the Lord's work in some shape or form. Uh, not because you have to, but because you really want to because the Lord is good as we've already been singing and reading this morning. So next week, 35% um, of the offering uh, that comes together, uh, and we're sometimes in the range of forty, fifty thousand dollars $50,000 with the total offering money, so it's a really significant sum. About 35% of that will go to YFC Backstage to help them with their renovations that they've started. It'll be the first year of three years that we will be supporting them in this way. And then the other 15% will go towards a, an MDS project. You might see some pictures behind me right now. I'm not sure if they're up there. Um, an MDS project up in the in Interlake. Uh, there's a lady that, whose house burned down. Um, earlier this year or last year, and MDS is helping her to rebuild a new uh, house for herself. And uh, so this, you see some of the pictures there, 15% uh, of the offering will be go towards that project, and then the other 50% goes towards our budget. So I hope that you'll come ready to give uh, well uh, to this offering next week, whether you're young uh, or a little bit older. Uh, I hope that uh, you'll have a great delight in supporting the Lord's work here in our church and way beyond that as well. So I think that's enough with those pictures. <coughs> We're on the theme of Thanksgiving, and Psalm 107 was just read. Psalm 103, you are hopefully familiar with those. Uh, this psalm starts with the powerful words, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. What are they? Verse 3, forgives all your iniquity, who heals all your diseases, redeems your life from the pit, crowning you with steadfast love and mercy, who satisfies you with good so that your youth is renewed like the eagle's. Verse 8, the Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. He will not always chide, nor will he keep his anger forever. He does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. If he did, we would be condemned eternally. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his steadfast love toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. As a father shows compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him. Did you know that our brains are actually at odds with the concept of thanksgiving? According to researchers, 
there's this thing called a negativity bias that we all have. Genesis chapter 3 revisited, maybe. Here's what one professor writes about this. Christian Thorogood is his name. He's a professor of psychology at Villanova University. Part of the reason we are so quick to be outraged, yet slow to offer gratitude at work and in life more broadly, is because of the widespread finding that human beings possess a negativity bias. He says that even when they're of equal intensity, negative events and experiences have a much more potent effect on our thoughts, emotions, and behavior than do neutral or positive events and experiences. Is that true in your life? Probably is, at least in part or at times. So let's think of the positive things. I'm not sure if you picked up on the real positive announcement this week. Do you know who won the Nobel Peace Prize this week? What? James Peebles. Peebles. Uh, That wasn't the Peace Prize. That was the Physics Prize. Yeah, that's the science teacher jumping the gun here. The, the president of the country of Ethiopia. Why is that significant? He is an evangelical Christian. And he's contributed since being voted into the presidency there to peace being reached with the neighboring country of Eritrea with whom uh, Ethiopia has been at war for quite a few years. He's an evangelical Christian of Pentecostal persuasion. Last year's Nobel Peace Prize winner a gynecologist in Congo, an evangelical Christian, also of Pentecostal persuasion. If that isn't good news, here are Christians, a doctor, a president of a country who are just sensing that there's something in them, a power in them, the gospel of Jesus Christ, that causes them to engage society for peace, or for healing victims of rape. That's what the doctor from Congo has been involved with. So there's some positive stuff that we want to focus on because there's so much negative news out there every single day. I hate watching news. Getting sick and tired of it. Seriously. I recently read a book, or I'm still reading it, not finished with it yet. Here's the title of the book. Christians in the Age of Outrage. This book got me thinking and wondering, for example, about a couple of the most recent expressions of outrage that you maybe all followed. There was the climate strikes that took place in Canada on September 27th. And then this week there were protests, six million people that were part of protests around the world called the Extinction Rebellion. Interesting way to give your protest a title, Extinction Rebellion. At the center of the climate strikes on September 27th was a young Swedish girl called Greta Thunberg. I'd been following her for many weeks prior because I listened to European news every night, um, so long before the Canadian climate strike took place. I got wondering a little bit about things. Who is actually behind this girl? How real are her and others' fears about this world we call home in a time of global warming, rising seas, melting polar ice caps, unheard of weather events, and so on. And then came her talk at the UN Climate Conference. She said a bunch of different things there, but the one that stung most was the following statement. Here, that's Greta Thunberg that you see up in the picture. She said to those older people gathered at the UN Climate Conference, You stole my childhood. How dare you? Now, to be sure, she seemed to be sincere as she spoke. But her statement got me wondering. It's a pretty brutal statement, isn't it? But is it true of Greta Thunberg? Now, maybe she wasn't intending this to be a logical statement. Maybe it was just an emotional appeal to just do something about global warming, you grown-ups. She was addressing politicians and anyone else who's not willing to participate in an immediate ecological revolution. And she basically called them monsters. Because who else would rob a young, unsuspecting child of their childhood? So what did she mean by, you robbed me of my childhood? It's not so clear, actually, if you think about it. 
Because obviously she wasn't talking about being forced into child labor. That happens to people in places like India to this very day. She wasn't talking about those poor child soldiers forcibly enlisted in some African countries. She wasn't talking about those girls who are sold as sex slaves to or by some Arab millionaire uh, or warlord in the country of Sudan. And it didn't appear that she was complaining about being forbidden to play with her friends or listen to whatever music she likes or watching videos. So what did she actually mean with the statement? You robbed me of my childhood. Was she trying to say that those lazy politicians are forcing her and other youths to go to strike and demonstrate instead of going to school and meet friends and study up on the latest clean technologies? Is that what she meant? You robbed me of my childhood? Now, it must be difficult for a 16-year-old to be thrust into the limelight. By whom is the question? As the consummate hero, as you badmouth all the powers that be who are seen to be causing the end of the world. But why the bad-mouthing? Where does Greta Thunberg live? What has she actually lost in her childhood in the country of Sweden? What's missing in all of this? I think I can tell you. It's gratitude. It's gratitude for all human advancements that have made her life Yes, Greta Thunberg's life as well, much more enjoyable and livable to this day, as God's gift to humankind. And that brings us back to the text in Psalm 103, and to this Thanksgiving weekend. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. What I was missing are some concrete examples of how this young girl still ought to be extremely thankful for. But it's missing. Who's advising her? Who are the doomsday prophets using her for maybe their own ulterior ends? So let's contrast Psalm 103 with Psalm 106, which is similar to Psalm 107, which was just read by Henry and McTeeson. My wife and I read through Psalm 106 in a devotional booklet recently over multiple days. And pay attention to this repeated cycle of God blessing his people. They respond by forgetting his good deeds. They then end up being subservient to enemy nations on account of their sin. They cry out to God and God saves them again and again and again. Psalm 106, if you want to follow in in the Pew Bibles, that's page 598. He opens up with this salvo, you might call it. Praise the Lord. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. Verse 7. Our fathers, when they were in Egypt, did not consider your wondrous works. They did not remember. That is, bring into active, positive remembrance the abundance of your steadfast love. But instead they rebelled by the sea at the Red Sea. Yet he saved them for his namesake that he might make known his mighty power. Then they believed his words, verse 12. They sang his praise, but they soon forgot his works. They did not wait for his counsel. 21. They forgot God, their Savior, who had done great things in Egypt, wondrous works in the land of Ham, and awesome deeds by the Red Sea. 25. They murmured in their tents and did not obey the voice of the Lord. Therefore he raised his hand and swore to them that he would make them fall in the wilderness. 29. They provoked the Lord to anger with their deeds, and a plague broke out, broke out among them. 32. They angered him at the waters of Meribah, and it went ill with Moses on their account. 37. They even literally sacrificed their sons and their daughters to the demons. Verse 40. Then the anger of the Lord was kindled against his people, and he abhorred his heritage. Their enemies oppressed them. Verse 42. And they were brought into subjection under their power. Many times he delivered them, but they were rebellious in their purposes and were brought low through their iniquity. 
And he concludes, verse 47, Save us, O Lord our God, and gather us from among the nations that we may give thanks to your holy name and glory in your praise. Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, from everlasting to everlasting. And let all the people say, Amen. Praise the Lord. So how do you counteract forgetfulness? How do you counteract outrage? With an attitude of gratitude. So here's sort of what I would expect from anybody sincerely concerned about living life here on earth, as we know it, in general, and maybe even who's concerned about climate change in particular. I have no doubt that it's real, in case you're wondering where I'm going with all of this. But also people who are not just concerned, but also willing to change their own habits as an authentic expression of their concern. Here's what I sort of mean. Pardon me if I put it this way. Greta Thunberg, would you also take time to just thank those many scientists and entrepreneurs who have contributed to a major reduction in child mortality rates over the past 100 years? Today, in Western countries, the rate is 0.5%. In non-industrial countries or pre-modern countries, there's something that's called between 30 and 50%. In the late 19th century, half of children did not make it past their fifth year, uh, their fifth birthdays, at least in the country of Germany. Greta and company, would you just thank those who contribute to the decreased number of deaths by starvation? And would you thank those who have given the youth of today unprecedented options in their choice of occupation, of spouse, of vacation possibilities? Would you thank those unionists who have helped reduce typical hours of work from 60 or more during the Industrial Revolution to the more than manageable 35 to 40 hours a week today? Would you thank those who have cemented freedom of speech, freedom of religion, extensive gender equality in your country's constitution? Would you thank those who, who contributed to our amazing, healthy, and nutritious diets. We have year-round fruits and vegetables from all over the world sent to us in these frozen parts of the world like Canada and Sweden. That was unheard of 100 years ago. Would you thank those who have made universal health care, public security, free education, political participation, clean air and water available to these very same young people. So Greta, would you please just say thank you for your clean, your prosperous, your peaceful, your healthy youth experience. And maybe for those at the UN whom you publicly lambasted for their efforts to keep this world a peaceful and prosperous world for as many as possible. So what did the older generation actually steal from Greta Thunberg beats me. But this much I know. We are living in a day where everyone is outraged about everything. And ironically, you might think that this sermon is a kind of outrage against the outrage. So, back to the drawing board of gratitude, please. Each and every one of us. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and forget not all his benefits. And then that statement, who satisfies you with good so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. And then, in the power of this gratitude to God for his world that he entrusted to our human care and development, let us keep it a beautiful place. Let's make it even better wherever possible but always in humility before God, creator and sustainer, savior and Lord, coming king and judge of this world. And then let's make sure that we aren't hypocritical in, the, in light of the plight of millions of other kids worldwide who would probably give anything to live in this so wretched place called Sweden or Canada. So may God give us hearts full of gratitude this morning.
And may we all be reminded that he has blessed us in many more ways than we ever count. Lord, would you just allow us to be people that are so grateful for every little and greater benefit that we can't help but praise you every single day. In spite of some of the darkness that we see around us, may our hearts be filled with joy in you. Amen. And now I will uh, hand off to Pastor Kelby, and he'll introduce the person that's getting baptized, and they'll take it from there. This on? There we go. This morning, I am, I'm very thankful to be able to uh, stand beside Gavin Braski as he gets baptized this morning. So you can come on up, Gavin. Um, I don't know whether I had had a conversation with Gavin before this morning. I'll, I'll admit that. And so I took the Sunday school hour and we sat together in my office and we chatted about all kinds of things from, from volleyball to your new, maybe not so new truck and, uh, and your time at camp as well. And that was, that was great to, to hear your heart, uh, especially about the camp uh, and your, your three weeks that you spent there. You're going to talk more about that though. So I'll hand it over to you to, to share your testimony. Hello, I'm Gavin Braski, and I'm 16 years old. I was born into a Christian home, and I grew up hearing Bible stories, but I never really understood the meaning behind them. But in, when I was seven, I went to Rose River Bible Camp for the first time, and the speaker told us about God's awesome love and that Jesus came to save me and forgive me. The, he then asked us if we wanted Jesus in our hearts, and if so, to pray a prayer with him. I did, and since that day, I've been striving to know the meaning behind the stories in the Bible more. Then, in the past few years, the past few years have been very impactful in my spiritual walk. Two years ago, Bobby asked me if I'd like to write and speak a sermon with him, and and for the following weeks, we met together and planned what I would speak on. I talked about being unashamed of what God has given us. A few weeks after that, then I went to Nicaragua on a missions trip where we helped the locals in a small village called El Tronco for the past, oh, yeah. For the past two years, I've been able to help at Reserve Bible Camp. Last year, I was in work crew and we did chores around the camp and like dishes and stuff. And this last summer, I did CLP. It's a three week program where you do a lot of studying the Bible and in your last week, you lead a cabin with a senior cabin leader. Those three weeks really helped me understand how unfathomable God really is. That's why I've chosen to get baptized, to show that God has saved me and that through his son, I can have life with him eternally. Two verses that have really impacted me are Romans 1.16 and Romans 10.9. Romans 10.9 says, Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one, co one confesses and is saved. And Romans 1.16 says, For I am unashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. Both of these verses assure us of our salvation, and they are a place that you can go for encouragement. This morning, Gavin has asked Bobby to, to come and pray for him as well, so I'll invite Bobby now. Yeah, would you join me in a, a prayer of blessing over Gavin? Heavenly Father, uh, it's been an honor for me to see the way that Gavin has grown in his spiritual stature, uh, basically as fast as he's been growing in his physical stature, and it's just been uh, amazing to see the way that uh, he's guided, uh, he's been guided by you, accepted the call, um, and, and I think about the way that I am proud of, of Gavin. I, I can't even comprehend how much more proud of him you are. And Lord, uh, it's just been so amazing to see the way that uh, you've established Gavin's steps, the way that you've uh, paved the pathways, sometimes in a way that is hidden to us at first. Um, but Gavin has faithfully followed in, those, in your wake, uh, accepted the call, even... 
uh, this week, just accepting the call of the impromptu baptism that you've laid on Pastor Walter's heart, we can see that uh, you are establishing his steps. And Father, his testimony doesn't end here. This is just the beginning of the testimony of the mighty works that you have planned for Gavin. And I just pray that Gavin continues to recognize the mighty um, evidence for your invisible hand to follow in your footsteps, to have the courage to take the steps, to accept the call uh, when you call him. And Father, I, I just pray that <clears throat> you give him the, the courage to uh, continue on, to embrace the robe of righteousness that, that you will equip him with, and that, uh, that he continues to act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly before you. Amen. All right. Me and Gavin will make our way to the baptistry. you a question. Do you believe that Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior, that he died on the cross, rose three days later for the forgiveness of your sins? Yes, I do. And Gavin, upon confession of your faith, I baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. 